Uh, my name is David Turden. I work for the Ministry for Culture and Heritage uh, in New Zealand, and we've been embarking on a project for the last little while, um, migrating from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, 9, 10, um, and we engaged uh, Jonathan from Catalyst to upgrade our data model to something more appropriate. Um, so this is a presentation on basically how that's gone. Um, we're not quite live yet, but we're not far away. Yeah, so I'm Jonathan Hunt. I work at Catalyst. I'm based out of Christchurch uh, and been working with Drupal for, I don't know, 18 years or thereabouts from, anyway, 4.6 I think was the first version I started with um, and have a particular interest in kind of cultural heritage and glamour sector, so galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and that was a pretty good fit for the kind of material that MCH were working with. Um, so, obviously, uh, NZ History is a complex site. Uh, there are lots and lots of content types, lots and lots of information, of various different formats. Um, this, uh, some of the challenges there on the screen, the, the data model was inconsistent. Uh, it was, well, there wasn't really a data model to be, there was content types and that was about it. Um, we had a whole bunch of files and media that, were, that had been added to the site on an ad hoc basis for various reasons over a long, long period of time, again, inconsistently. Um, and I guess we needed to get that under control. Um, so New Zealand History is basically uh, obviously a government-based site talks about New Zealand history in a bunch of different formats, uh, primarily stories, events, biographies and places, uh, and there's a, a little screenshot of one of the, of one of the events, the uh, Hawke's Bay earthquake in 1931. Um, we collate a whole bunch of information based on tags. Um, which we call keywords, um, and this allows us to present information collectively based on what that information has been tagged on. So we have events, images, uh, biographies, so on and so forth, places. Um, our new Drupal 10 site has approximately 41,600 nodes and 18 different content types. And just as a, an aside there, New Zealand history started in 1999 as static HTML, um, moved to Joomla, to Drupal 4.7, Drupal 5, Drupal 7, and now finally to Drupal 10. Um, and just a few other points to be made. Uh, the information on NZ History has spawned several books, um, including one called Today in New Zealand History, which is based on all the events stored in, 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 the, in the website. Uh, it contains several external databases of information, for example, the, all the suffragists that signed the suffrage petition in New Zealand in the 1890s, um, uh, a, a, a database of Boer War soldiers, uh, a database of all of the people who, try, who signed the uh, Treaty of Waitangi, for example. Um, and there's also a large section on the website uh, aimed at schools, teachers primarily, but also students. And there is scope in the future to expand that because um, New Zealand history has now been added to the New Zealand curriculum, uh, which is a new thing over the last year or two. Um, uh, weirdly enough, we never taught New Zealand history in New Zealand schools. Um, so there's the... That's the home page. We, we have a, uh, a, obviously hooks off to a whole bunch of little rabbit holes there. Um, so the, aim, the primary aims of the upgrade was to uh, retain all the functionality, uh, to simplify everything as much as we could, uh, to align with Drupal standards, um, reduce custom code, uh, which is always a bit of a challenge, and to make it a bit more sustainable, 
uh, we wanted to align it with with other sites that we have in house as well. Um, things like consistent consistent setup and use of modules and so forth. Thanks, David. So just to outline some of the challenges that we ran into, so you can, um, from the history that David provided, this content's been around, or some of the content's been around for almost 24 years. So the site's gone through a, a lot of evolution and over time had accumulated all sorts of kind of, I guess, dead ends in terms of things that had been used temporarily or experimented with or whatever that was still sitting in the code base. Um, various content types and uh, the use of different vocabularies and so forth that may have been useful at some point, but were not necessarily continue to be useful. So we spent a lot of time analyzing the D7 code base and looking at the data structures, uh, doing lots of exports of the database as CSV and things, uh, often putting that into tools like OpenRefine, which lets you quickly facet by values that are in a column. And, and it's a great way to get a sense of the shape of the data that you're potentially working with. And especially where there may or may not be institutional memory of, you know, I don't know, that was before my time. And, and so you might not have people on tap. Um, you might not have subject matter experts who can explain all of the ways a different field might be being used. Um, because sometimes, you know, there'll be, there may be theme functions or whatever that are, that are using a certain value. And it's not always obvious that that's the case. Um, and then there's some data model challenges. So for example, there was a D7 content type called suffragist. But in practice, that was referring both to the signature of by a person on a petition, on a certain sheet of, of the petition, but it was also used as a foundation for a biography about the person. So that node is doing a lot of, a lot of work. Uh, and similar with uh, treaty signatory, it was treated a similar way. There was both information about what, sh what sheet of the Treaty of Waitangi did they sign on what date and where, but also a biography of that person and their whānau and their whakapapa. Uh, we had things like a lot of images in the system, but some of those images were then treated specially because they were images of New Zealand war memorials and they were showing up on a map of war memorials and so forth. So it's really stretching the definition of what an image is, is describing. Uh, there was also a lot of uh, a, a lot of files. I don't know exactly if we know how many tens of thousands. Yeah. Um, and there was numerous unmanaged files. So those were files that had just that had been put directly onto the file system and then referenced directly in markup, but they weren't managed by Drupal, and they weren't treated as Drupal media. So uh, and, and often they would have complex markup around them. So they might be hyperlinked. They might have um, divs around them that place them on the edge of the the content and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of, uh, not ad hoc, but, but tricky um, markup, and that's you know a challenge for migrating it into a, into a Drupal 10 structure. There's also lots of embedded content. There's lots of rich media. So there's panoramas, there's tiled images, there's audio, video, uh, all sorts of material. There was PHP in Node content, which is often problematic, uh, and NZ history because of its nature has got some quite complex navigation. So I'll just go into some of the details of how we dealt with those. So first was data model. Uh, the Drupal 7 site linked a lot of things together by just plain tagging. Uh, at least in some cases, these tags were typed. So there was a distinct, a distinct field that would say whether this tag is a place or a person. So we leveraged that to migrate into Drupal 10 into distinct taxonomies. So rather than all these things being in a single taxonomy, we could break it out into specific Drupal 10 taxonomies of person, geographic location, temporal subject, etc. And in most of these, we we simply borrowed the existing configs for taxonomies from the Islandora project, which is a Drupal distribution for a digital repository. Uh, and it comes pre-built with a bunch of uh, taxonomies that are useful for cultural heritage. And so for something like a a Drupal 7 suffragist content type, we split that up into, in Drupal 10, that became a suffragist signature. So that was a, a content type describing the signature, who made it, and where it was on the petition. And then separately to that, mapping that signature to a person entity in the person taxonomy. And that person entity can have date of birth, date of death, 
birthplace, biography, all of that kind of information, uh, or at least a link to a biography. Uh, similarly with biography content types in Drupal 7, we split that into a biography node, which is the kind of narrative, and then it has a relationship to a person entity. Um, and that's because when you conflate those things, you, you have a poor data model. You want to make assertions about the person, but they don't apply to the biography. So the person might have a date of birth, but the biography has a date of creation and it has an author and all that kind of stuff. And if you've conflated those kind of things, it gets very difficult to make useful statements about them. So an example is Kate Shepard. Uh, so the suffragist signature has a certain node and the signer is the person Kate Shepard, which is a different ID in the taxonomy. And similarly, there's a biography node about Kate Shepard, but it maps to the same taxonomy entity. And we achieved that by doing migration, um, or several migrations. So we'd run a migration across the biography nodes and build the D10 taxonomy terms for people. And then we'd run another migration, which is from the same material, but it would generate nodes. And, and that way we've just got multiple migration YAMLs that had got different um, destinations. And uh, after migrating treaty signatories and things, we've got over 31,000 person entities in there, and they're all distinct. And one of the rationales for doing that is so that we can actually share schema.org data. So if I click on here, we should, oh, no, not that one, this one. So just to give you some idea, all of this can be serialized out as JSON link data, which means you've got a structured data format describing the person or the place or whatever, which is um, really useful in the GLAM sector for starting to share uh, across other cultural sector organizations that are describing similar things. But one of the challenges of having 31,000 person entities is Drupal taxonomy um, tends not to like <laughs> uh, or won't even render potentially if you've got thousands of nodes because by default it treats things as hierarchical. But a person taxonomy isn't necessarily hierarchical. Uh, so we worked around that by building um, our own admin view in this case, using uh, a module which we've got on GitHub at the moment called CCA Taxonomy Manager. And that basically um, indexes all of the terms into Search API. Um, by default, it just goes into Search API DB, but you could just as easily index it into Solar. And I find that interesting because Solar has some algorithms for search that will be um, really performant for name matching, for example. So there's, there's potential improvements that we can go on to. And also um, with the custom view, we could add things like view bulk operations. So if you've got you know, tens of thousands of nodes, there's every chance you have duplicates. So one of the things we can do is term move or term merge based on views, views bulk ops. And just to give you an idea, that's the kind of view um, that we have. So we, we tried to emulate some of the features of the default uh, taxonomy administration. So you can add a term from this page, but it tells you how many terms you're dealing with. You've got a search you can use the view bulk ops to select a few terms and then you can start using um, actions on those. So the migration sequence that we followed is pretty standard. Um, we had to do some prep beforehand. Uh, that included, because we had all these unmanaged files, our solution for that was um, to scan the file system and generate a JSON artifact out of that. Uh, and we also had to bump things like file IDs and, and media IDs. We tried to preserve the IDs across D7 and D10 because that makes debugging a whole lot easier. Uh, then we move on to migrating all the taxonomy terms, migrating files and media, migrating nodes. And as part of the migration of nodes, it often included changing image references into Drupal media embeds and things like that. Finally, migrating comments because they're about the node, uh, attached to nodes usually, and then URL aliases. So that's a fairly typical progression for most migrations. So for the unmanaged files, for example, uh, we wanted to model these in media. And part of the rationale for that, you know, we, we could have just copied all of the unmanaged files across, but that kind of persists the problem, right? It means you're bypassing the whole functionality of a content management system because it's not actually managing half the material. Um, and there's risks of having unmanaged files on the file system. And the other thing is that at least if we started to embrace the media model in Drupal 10, you could start attaching attribution fields and, and things like source and copyright and uh, various other attribution. And we based the model for that on um, Creative Commons, and they have some best practices for attribution. 
And, and that way we've got some consistency. So whether you're dealing with an image or a video or a panorama or anything else, there's some commonality in terms of the data model around that. Uh, as part of the migration, we ran a pre-process that would scan through the file sy system hierarchy. It would ignore certain file types that we didn't particularly care about. It would generate some JSON. We would store that JSON, and then that was the feed into the next migration, which was to read the JSON and start building uh, files in D10, and then using the same source and the MIME type, start to build the particular uh, media types that we want. So obviously image and video, audio, but then we had a bunch of other ones that we needed to deal with as well. Uh, we used the media migration module, and within that there's a process plugin called image tag to embed filter. So that will take your image tag from the markup of say the body field of a D7 node, and then replace it with a Drupal media embed that CK at a four or five knows what to do with. So that was a big part of it, especially, and we extended that because we had to then parse a lot of the context of that because in the D7 markup might be attribution or it might be alignment or it might be sizing or a whole bunch of other attributes that we had to extract from the D7 markup and encode that as um, data for CK to look at. Uh, and in a few cases, and, it, and it's kind of a bit ugly, but it seemed to work, was we would, while we were migrating um, the nodes, we were lifting data out of the markup of the node, and that was data that had a better home back in the media. So even though we're doing a node migration, as a side effect of that node migration, we were potentially fine tracking down media in D10 and then adding data into the media, um, which seems to abuse the, the migration kind of separation of concerns. But on the other hand, it was a way of managing, you know, when you've got this kind of really um, challenging source material, it was a way of trying to preserve the data in the best possible D10 data structures. Um, having said that, uh, dealing with Image alt data is still somewhat of a challenge. Um, there was also a lot of iframes in the system, so there were um, sprinkled throughout the Drupal 7 site were a lot of YouTube and Vimeo embeds, and we could map those in Drupal 10 using the remote video uh, module. Uh, for Brightcove, uh, we used Drupal Media Remote, which uh, gave us a kind of a, a plugin structure that we extended and used for a bunch of other external content that wasn't readily available in the contrib module. So that included things like New Zealand on screen. So you could extend the media remote formatter base and basically just describe a new formatter that knows how to render the kind of um, markup that would invoke uh, NZ on screen embed data. Similarly for Podbean, which is uh, essentially remote audio, remote podcasts. So we could just define a remote audio media type and start, start mapping that. So we, we ended up with a fairly common pattern where in some cases we would define the intended media for Drupal 10 as a static migration, and that looks like this kind of stuff. So you basically define some YAML and you define the media that you want to create in Drupal 10. And this is simply based on doing some SQL queries on D7, identifying the, the handful of instances or maybe tens or whatever of, of media and creating a static migration for those that would generate the D10 media that we wanted. And they were indexed by um, URL. So when we were doing the migration of the node and we're parsing the body content, content, we could detect the URL, figure out what the D10 media was that matched that URL, and then generate a media embed based on the UUID. Uh, as uh, so, NZ History and Drupal 7 also has a bunch of other interesting media types that didn't really have any existing equivalents that we could track down in Drupal 10. So, I've already mentioned remote audio, but there was also things like panoramas using Pano 2 VR. There were some custom interactives that had been built over the years that were using arbitrary JavaScript and showing slides and various other things. So, again, we used a fairly similar approach. And we tried to map them all to different media types so that editors, no matter what they were embedding in content, they would still go through the media library and they could use all the same tools no matter what it was that they were embedding in, in a narrative. Um, and we could also attach the attribution fields and things that we talked about. 
So we ended up with um, a fairly extensive set of, of media types. So you know, out of the box, Drupal comes with image, video, audio, uh, remote video, and maybe file or document, um, document for PDF. But then we've added things like panorama, um, remote uh, audio, step through slideshow, um, Zoomify, which is tiled image zooming and so on. So just a few examples of what those look like. Here's an example of um, a Google map embedded through CK Editor 5. And this is to get away from the whole idea of, of just ha allowing arbitrary iframes to be pasted in by editors because it could be an iframe to a bot, you know, to a, a, a crypto bot or, or whatever. Um, and this, again, trying to get consistency of approach across, you know, multiple users and multiple um, content environments. Uh, memorials, uh, sorry, in this case, um, panoramas. So we'll just see if I can make that work. Click on here. So in this case, the files already existed, but we could, oh, it's popped up and So I'll just see if I can, here we go. So, oh, that one, thank you. So yeah, so this is what it looks like in practice. We can go full screen on there. So this is Gallipoli and you can look around. But again, from a, from a, um, it is a point of, point of view. It's the same as embedding any other material. Once the media is created, we can, we can use this in a multiple nodes. Uh, this is an example of a step through uh, slide set. So again, just show an example of what that looks like in practice. Uh, it's talking about the infamous 1981 Springbok tour. And this is a, an example of a custom interactive. So it's basically a, a bit of CSS and JavaScript that lands when you're on this kind of content. And you can step through like that. But again, from the point of view of, of migration and editors, it's, it's just another media type. Uh, one of the other examples is uh, the tiled images. So they were generated in Drupal 7 through Zoomify. That's a proprietary system that isn't well supported in Drupal 10. Uh, I was already familiar through Island Dora with OpenSea Dragon, which is a tiled image viewer. Um, and it turns out it's got a plugin that lets it use Zoomify tiles. So we didn't have to regenerate any tiles. We just shifted those across and, and left those in place for now. Again, we had a bit of a preprocessor to run beforehand um, because the D7 files had been sprinkled around with different naming conventions. So we ran a, a, a wee script to just tidy all of that up and land the content in a consistent location. And then um, migrated the media and pointed it at the new location of the files. And again, I had a one of these, this one, I think. Oh, no, it's JSON LD. So this is what it looks like in practice. Again, you can you can go full screen and then you can drill down on on the material that's in there. Um, I have to escape. Uh oh. But anyway, depending on the content, it's a really great way. If you've got high resolution scans, I mean, those could be photographs or scans of maps and so forth. It's a really nice way of demonstrating stuff. The other good thing is once you've got OpenSea Dragon in place, it can use the, um, the IIIF uh, image format, and that's a international standard for sharing large format images and not just tiling, but um, there's a presentation API and so forth associated with it. Um, so that's hopefully something that MCH will make more use of in the future. Do you want to talk about a few more of the challenges? Um, so again, because of the way that the site was built inconsistently over a long period of time by multiple different people or, and agencies, uh, we ended up with things like um, views embed PHP blocks right through the site. Um, and so we basically just moved them uh, using the in, insert view module or just creating a manual manually created sorry manually inserting blocks that were created by views um, one of the things we really aimed to do was reducing our custom code we again because of the way that sites were manhandled over the years we ended up with an awful lot of custom code and some of it didn't really do a lot 
um, and it, uh, some of it was actually outdated and wasn't even needed. So Drupal 7 had 38 custom modules, um, most of which were doing very simple things. And we managed to cut that down in Drupal 10 to 14 modules. There was about uh, five or six that were exact replicas from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10. For example, the complex um, browse slash um, menu system. Uh, and, and of those uh, 14 custom modules, there were six just for that to handle the interactive migrations. So, um, uh, so uh, CK editor to four to five, um, obviously one of the things we have allowed in the past with, uh, and particularly in EZ history, but also in some of our other sites as well, we have full HTML access to all of our editors. Uh, we tried to cut that down or we managed to cut that down to, um, to much more limited uh, appropriate use of HTML tags in CK Editor 5, but that required a bit of forward planning. Um, what could we do without? What do we need? Uh, there was a bit of analysis about allowing what we needed to allow and not allow in CK Editor 5. Um, um, but that seemed to work out pretty well. And lastly, where to from here? Okay, so we have another site in the pipeline for migrations. This is Tiara. Tiara is the Encyclopedia of New Zealand, believe it or not. Um, initially conceived as an online encyclopedia. Uh, 980 stories, approximately 5,700 pages, 28,000, we call them resources, in-house images, sound, video, interactives. Um, there are a, a few other things tagged onto the encyclopedia, like the Dictionary of New Zealand Biographies, uh, approximately 3,100 live biographies, and over 4,000 associated uh, images and, and media. Um, and the good thing about Teata is that because it was designed right from the start as an encyclopedia, its content structure is very consistent and should be much easier. Um, but, however, the uh, the actual data structure is in on of itself more more complicated um, because of all the relations it has. Um, so uh, we want to look at things like uh, multi-site federated search. We have a little bit of that in Drupal 7, but we just want to make it a little bit more consistent across all of our sites. Uh, we would like to look at exposure of some of our information through APIs, um, sharing of data, and for example, uh, Tiara has also a tag slash keyword system. Um, we would like to share content from NZ History and Tiara together on each other's sites for the same sort of, uh, for the same keyword or entity. Um, potentially we would look at um, being an authoritative data source for some of this information, particularly, for example, the, uh, the New Zealand biographies um, and, and more use of the IIIF uh, standard for presentation. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd like to mention about Tiara is that it has, has one of the largest, or it did have, and I don't know whether it's ever been superseded, but it has the largest body of online Tiara content uh, in the world. And this has been provided over the years to multiple agencies to assist in the machine learning of the native language. So. Um, that's something that we're interested in pursuing a little bit further. Um, we're not sure what that looks like in the future, but definitely it's it's in our plans. Or well, it's in our thoughts. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for coming along. And um, yeah, if we've got a minute or two, maybe we could take a couple of questions. Thanks. Can you use
integration to read. I, I guess in theory, potentially we can. Um, the issue we have in house at the moment is that we're not allowed to use AI, um, or we are allowed to use certain sources of AI, but not open AI. So uh, that makes it slightly more complicated, you know, getting Drupal to talk to Microsoft um, AI systems. So, uh, so probably at the stage, no. Um, but one of the things we have is is that we're still actually working on that. And as of a couple of weeks ago, we did make a little bit of a breakthrough, and we have not migrated all of it, but certainly we're, we're on the path to migrating all of the stuff we have existing. Having said that, you know we have still tens of thousands of of images that have zero alt text, so something like that, something like using a, open AI or AI in general. To to do that would be a good starting point. Uh, good question. Um, we haven't actually, we haven't considered upgrading the design at this point. We're just going to reproduce the existing design. Um, Mostly because we don't have the capacity at this stage to to, to do that work, unfortunately. This sounds like it's been a massive task. So congrats to you guys for getting so far on this amazing work. Um, out of interest, in, I haven't dealt with legacy sites myself. Drupal seven, Drupal ten migration, a massive piece of work. What was your sort of keys to success? Getting this done. It's such a common habit. What is what is sort of the highlights of the things you did well? Hmm, thanks for the question. Um, I don't know. I think we had a really good working culture. We we collaborated through GitLab and we we drafted a whole stack of issues in GitLab describing each content type and each taxonomy and the fields and where we were at. So I think we had you know we've had weekly meetings. So constant dialogue between people like myself bringing some technical capability, but then the MCH staff who've got the background and knowledge and the direction of where they want to go and all that kind of stuff. So I'd probably say the, the key to success was just having a really good relationship and a, and a way that we could talk through whatever challenges we're running into. And, you know, it would be easy to run away and start throwing technology at stuff, but the trick was to know when that was appropriate and when it wasn't. Um, and I think things worked out pretty well. Yeah, I, th I think w uh, one of the other uh, major factors to our success was that the person who wrote the site in HTML in 1999 is still the chief editor of NZ History to this day. So the institutional knowledge was, was actually there, which helped a lot. Uh, interesting, interestingly enough, he didn't remember every single little question we asked him, but definitely the big ticket items were. were. So that was, that was actually really useful. So did you ever make any considerations of using Sony? Because you're dealing with people, you know, just in going through a summer, months, dealing with very few as well, and a lot of different things. Um, I didn't really because in this case I've been working with Island Aura for quite a while and I knew that it came with a suite of taxonomies including fields on those taxonomies that were quite applicable and at this stage we haven't really needed to customize those we could add further fields but it just meant by standing up um, controlled access terms I think it was from Islandora we got like 10 different taxonomies that are all relevant to the to the material um, we have used oh name's fallen out of my head but the um, the headless content type that's available in Drupal 10. Um, we use that for points of interest for maps, for example. So we could we could extend that with some fields, but it didn't need to be a full content time. Um, thanks for the questions. If, if people want to follow up afterwards, I'm always happy to talk about this material and 
Like in particular, Drupal, I think, struggles with large taxonomies, and I'd love to make Drupal better in that space. So if you have an interest in that, then hit us up afterwards. But thanks for coming. Thank you.